state. As I uh, ring the bell, would you please join me in chanting the verse of the robe uh, three times as we do uh, in the morning. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching. I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all beings. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all beings. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all beings. I suggest that we chant in the verse of Bob is because it's um, it's one of those sneaky teachings on emptiness that we do each morning. That if you're not paying attention, uh, you don't notice. <clears throat> and for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, um, we'll go more slowly. Having heard it three times, you probably get the idea. Vast is the robe of emptiness. <clears throat> That's the robe of emptiness. That's the robe of liberation. A formless field of benefaction. It's got an interesting line, isn't it? That the robe of liberation is a formless field. So right off the bat, there's an invitation uh, around emptiness. There's a place up here if you want, unless you want to sit in the chair. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. And the formless field is of support, of care. <clears throat> Wearing the universal teaching, the universal teaching that was the Buddha's primary insight, and the Bodhi tree was what? In Sanskrit? Paticca Samapada. Paticca Speak up. <laughs> Just <laughs> on the bottom. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, depend the core rising. This <clears throat> formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching. Wearing the teacher samapada, wearing emptiness. It's not like a see through garment, isn't it? It's like wearing emptiness. <clears throat> I realize the one true nature, the interdependence of all being. <clears throat> 
thus harmonizing all being. The one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Uh, so it's it's a uh, a lot of teachings in a small uh, vessel. <clears throat> Let's take a look, since this is, um, you know, voices from emptiness, and since Nagarjuna is a particularly important and significant voice in the teachings on emptiness, and his verses are confounding and impenetrable to some people, let's not start there. (laughs) (laughs) We'll start with... um, Another Bodhisattva, a Polish poet, Wisława Zimburska. And there's two poems. Uh, let's start with Utopia. Because after all, what do most people think enlightenment is? <laughs> what is Utopia? What, is, what does it mean? Perfect space. Like, no no huh? Isn't it no place? Like, it really means no place. no place. Isn't that interesting? But we take it to mean the perfect place. But that turn is the turn we're studying, isn't it? That we take this no place and turn it into something we can use to our benefit that's for our pleasure. I and mean, it's a fascinating kind of thing. If you look at... Um, and you know about Zaborska? She a uh, Polish poet. She won the Nobel Prize. She died what, two years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, a wonderful woman, and has, a, as you can see, not only a, 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 an amazing mind, and she's a beautiful poet, but has a bit of wit about her around deep subjects. <clears throat> so here's her poem, um, Utopia. She's going to describe the place. Island where all becomes clear. Think about this as the way that we go in, like, okay, this is really cool, utopia. An island where all becomes clear. Solid ground beneath your feet. The only roads are those that offer access. Bushes bend beneath the weight of proofs. The tree of valid supposition grows here with branches disentangled since time immemorial. The tree of understanding, understanding, dazzlingly straight and simple, sprouts by the spring called, now I get it. (laughs) The thicker the woods, the vaster the vista, the valley of obviously. If any doubt arises, the wind dispels them instantly. Echoes stir unsummoned and eagerly explain all the secrets of the world. On the right, a cave where meaning lies. On the left, the lake of deep conviction. Truth breaks from the bottom and bobs to the surface. Unshakable confidence towers over the valley. Its peak offers an excellent view of the essence of things. For all its charms, The island is uninhabited, and the faint footprints scattered on its beaches turn without exception to the sea, as if all you can do here is leave and plunge, never to return into the depths, into unfathomable life. Lovely, huh? So we're going to plunge into the depth of unfathomable life, into no place, in which almost everything else in the poem are the ways in which we hope. I mean, it's even the reason you come to class, right? (laughs) (laughs) I just like the tree of valid supposition. The spring of, now I get it, the valley of obviously. (laughs) The lake of deep conviction. And my favorite is that truth breaks from the surface and bob. From the water and breaks to the surface, you know. <laughs> a view of the essence of things, and then she turns on you. But all its charm, 
that, we've, that brings us almost to everything we do, the only thing you can do is, is leave. And plunge never to return into the depths, into unfathomable. <coughs> It's a beautiful voice, isn't it, of emptiness. <clears throat> so I, just as last time, I gave you just a few tidbits and tastes from um, both <clears throat> Joanna Macy and uh, Stephen Batchelor work on uh, the fundamental teachings of Tichu Samapada, and we chanted a piece of the Prajnaparamita Sutra, the Heart Sutra, the most commonly chanted piece in, in Buddhist liturgy. Now we're going to take a, a leap forward to, uh, to the Varjana, and once again, I'm just going to give you some tastes of Stephen Batchelor's translation of the Varjana's work. There are many translations that you can get, and many commentaries, uh, most of which I find severely unhelpful. Um, they're academic, um, and in that case, if that's your interest, they're useful. Um, but they're not necessarily as useful for the practitioner as this, I think. And so that's the, why I recommend this. And, and he makes no bones about the way he made the translation in that regard. So I'm going to just take a few little pieces. We're going to read a few things uh, so we can um, plunge into the sea. You know, when we those of you that are used to our liturgy in the morning, when we chant the refuges, uh, and then that middle part where we say, I take refuge in Buddha, immersing, immersing, immersing body and mind deeply in the way, awakening to the mind. It's immersing body and mind deeply in the way. I take refuge in Dharma, entering deeply the merciful ocean of Buddha's way. I took refuge in Sangha, bringing harmony to everyone, free from hindrance. So there's something about immersing ourselves in the teaching, entering this ocean, the poet is suggesting, meeting harmony, which is what the rope chant is suggesting, comes by resting in this uh, field of infection. <coughs> I could hardly get past a statement that was on page three. You don't have to look in here because it's on your notes. Uh, because it is that uh, a beautiful, simplistic way, that simplistic, beautifully clear way that Stephen Batchelor writes that also is um, extremely upsetting. Nagarjuna discovered how to tolerate the terrifying and fascinating emptiness that quivers beneath the threshold of common sense. A great set of didn't say he, under, he explained the uh, mysteries of emptiness. He says he discovered how to tolerate the terrifying and fascinating emptiness that quivers beneath the threshold of common sense. Most of what's in uh, Utopia is the common sense part, right? Of course you want to understand these things. And when you find that uh, none of those things actually support liberation, and you begin to look into the depths, it can be a bit uh, terrifying, but it's also fascinating. It's like a really bad wreck you can't look away from, you know? it's like fascinating but terrifying. <coughs> and the, the next two paragraphs that I uh, took an excerpt from you, uh, you see that I have highlighted the last line of each. The first one suggests that emptiness is a cipher for freedom, and that emptiness is a metaphor for authenticity. So I like the way those two things go together. Um, let's, um, someone read the first one, please, the first paragraph there, just as nature. Just as nature, or an abandoned dwelling is devoid of human ownership, so experience is intrinsically neither me or mine. Recognizing mental and physical processes as empty of self was, for the Buddha, the way to dispel the confusion that lies at the origin of anguish. 
For such confusion configures a sense of self as a fixed and, and opaque thing that feels disconnected from the dynamic, contingent, and fluid process of life. Emptiness does not deny these vital processes. It challenges the insistent fixation about self that obscures them, thus rendering life flat, frustrating, and repetitive. Emptiness is a cipher for freedom. <coughs> One of those paragraphs we could spend the rest of the night on, of course, because there's, there's so much in there. Uh, but I particularly like the, uh, <coughs> uh, the metaphor in the beginning, just as nature or an abandoned dwelling is devoid of human ownership, so experience is intrinsically neither mean nor mine. And recognizing these things as empty, a dispelled confusion, the confusion was created by our idea that things are fixed <coughs> rather than dynamic. And it's important to underline that sentence that says emptiness does not deny these vital processes. Emptiness does not deny anything. It includes everything. In fact, everything is made more possible and clearer when we open things up instead of make them flat and solid and deadened. And the next short paragraph, <coughs> someone want to read that one? Yeah. A cipher. Uh, a cipher? What is a cipher? A puzzle. Hmm? Is it a puzzle? A symbol. A symbol or a code? Mm -hmm. It's like a code for freedom. It's like code word. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. You want to read the next one, Rebecca? Sure. <clears throat> Living in emptiness is equivalent to following the path to awakening itself. It not only entails letting go of craving and confusion, but cultivating awareness of and insight, insight into the nature of one's self and one's world. Emptiness is a metaphor for authenticity. So I, I put this one on the page because I like the, um, the contrast between letting go and cultivation. They're two aspects of practice. What do you let go of? Mm -hmm. And what do you cultivate? Awareness, Awareness and insight. Mm -hmm. Of what? Nature oneself in the world. Right. And so why would you say it's a metaphor for authenticity? Given that phrase. That's all that's left. All that's left is authenticity. It's all that remains. Yeah. To believe in the big self is a kind of delusion and Okay, so to believe in believe otherwise isn't authentic. Although we usually confuse it as authenticity. I am me. I just gotta be me. Yeah. <laughs> I just gotta be me. Which is basically it says I gotta suffer. It's a, it's a nice little koan to think about that. What is, um, why is emptiness a matter for authenticity? Well, I love that because that's what I hear you repeating again and again and again. And there it is in that little phrase, you know, letting go of our conditioned selves, letting things fall away. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that I think is tricky about this phrase, and once again, this piece, why I put it here, is it's very easy to run over the first three words. Mm -hmm. It's not about defining things. It says living in emptiness. Not mm -hmm. understanding emptiness. Not practice. It says living in emptiness. <clears throat> so 
if you just take out every single thing in the little paragraph except the first four words and the last word. What does it say? Living is authenticity. Is authenticity. Does that start to come home a little more? Even though you may not be quite sure what living in emptiness is, it starts to come a little closer. And in it are teaching pointers that living in emptiness is authentic as we let go of craving and confusion and we cultivate awareness and insight, the nature of self. There's a releasing and a seeing clearly. That life, that practice life, is an authentic life. Not that by practicing you will become authentic. You see, we start thinking authenticity is another thing we can have, another self. It isn't. <clears throat> it's the path of awakening itself. It's the path of awakening. It isn't a new thing you get when you wake up. And the way that I'm taking this apart, putting it back together, circling around, is what Nagarjuna does, by the way. Uh, only it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a little example here. If you want to follow along, you can. It's not, it's not necessary. Let's start at the bottom of page 9. And this is a, a point in which um, there's a wanderer, Vagogata, um, who asks the Buddha a very important question. So now we're going to go back. We're going to go back before Nagarjuna. He asks the Buddha, how is it, Venerable Gautama, does the self exist? So here's the guy that goes right for it. How is it that the self exists? The Buddha remains silent. This is his response. KG. <laughs> Again, Bhagavad How is it, Venerable Gautama, does the self not exist? Same answer. The wanderer Vagogata got up from his seat and went away. That's quite a dynamic interchange. <laughs> <laughs> How is it that the self exists? How does it not exist? Never mind. The Buddha turned to his attendant Ananda and said, If I had answered the self exists, that would have encouraged eternalism. If I had answered the self does not exist, that would have encouraged nihilism. And then I'm going to read a little more of uh, the author here. Although <clears throat> the Buddha taught a doctrine of selflessness, when answering the stranger of Agogate, he recognized how his own teaching of selflessness placed him on the horns of a dilemma. You know, he, he understood that teaches Samapada, and then he's going to have to talk. Like, oops. To be true to his middle way, he had to avoid saying anything that might suggest a person to be endowed with some kind of essential and permanent identity. Yet, nor could he suggest the opposite, that a person is a pure illusion, incapable of making moral choices that culminate in acts which bear psychological and social consequences. And you can say that. It doesn't make any sense. In steering a middle course between internalism and nihilism, the Buddha remains suspended between yes and no, self and no self, and silent emptiness. So this is the setup. This is the primary teaching that the Buddha is going <clears> to <throat> going to be facing. <clears throat> to dwell in emptiness 
go back to living in emptiness here. To dwell in emptiness means living with the ambiguous and non-dualistic nature of life. The ambiguous and non-dualistic nature of life. I uh, say it more crudely. I say it's messy. Messy. Life is messy. And I don't mean messy as in it should be ordered and is a mess and it could be right. I'm saying that's the nature of life. That it, it's, it's, um, it doesn't conform to what our conscious mind thinks it should be. It's what it is, which is usually a mess. And that that's not a brokenness and it's not a problem to be fixed. It's the way it is. And all that I just said is basically the first noble truth. To dwell in emptiness means living with the ambiguous and non-dualistic nature of life. That little fancier way of saying. This is clear from the Buddha's response to the questions of uh, <coughs> Katyana. Katyayana, sorry. So here's another, another question. He says, Katyayana, everyday experience relies on the duality of it is and it is not. So the Buddha saying to this guy, this is everyday life is characterized by it is or it is not. But for one who perceives how the things of the world arise and pass away, for him, there is no it is and no it is not. Everything exists is simply one extreme and nothing exists is the other extreme. The Tathagata, that's the Buddha, the one that thus comes, the Tathagata relies on neither of these two extremes. He teaches the Dharma as a middle way. While the middle ground, the middle way, is grounded in insight into the emptiness of self, it expands the experience of emptiness into a sensibility that resists any attempt to bend things down as this or that. So I, I read these first two stories because they give you some of the sort of background of the kind of things that Nagarjuna is drawing on, and he uses these stories. Um, and it also is sort of like a, a warning, isn't it? You read these and you go, uh-oh, this is not going to be easy, going, or at least not common sense. <clears throat> If you look on our first page, where I mention reflecting back on the Buddha in a middle way, and I mention the place where those stories exist, and right past it, it says, unknown to the Buddha, emptiness was also being taught in China by the Taoist sage Lao Tzu. For Lao Tzu, human anguish was resolved by living in harmony with the underlying principle of the Tao, or way. He saw the strife and misery of the world as symptoms of a society in which people had lost touch with the naturalness and the spontaneity of the way. So just historically, it's interesting that these teachings were arising at a very similar time. And next month, our third class uh, will fall on the heels of how the teachings of Lhasa and Taoism met the teachings of the Buddha in Hongxi. So this is like a teaser of things to come. Let's go back to uh, Nagarjuna. Would someone like to read the little historical paragraph at the bottom? Born of a Brahmin family in the south of India. He excelled in both secular studies and religious subjects, usually studied by the priestly caste. He was also a sensual young man and was almost killed while seducing women in the king's court. He escaped, fled to the mountains, became a monk, and studied the teachings of the Buddha. Within a short time, he had mastered the canonical texts, but his questions were not answered. An old monk introduced him to the doctrines of Mahayana Buddhism. So there's a lot more you know, to the story, the history, uh, but I think we don't really have the time to go in. But this is uh, 
this is enough, I think. He was, um, he was born into a high family. Obviously a smart guy. He did really well. He was also a guy. He got himself in trouble chasing women. And there's some sort of fancy magic stories about how he escaped. That he had learned all these techniques with his friends to how to disappear. Uh, so that they wouldn't catch him in the court, you know. And the only way he escaped, the way that they, his friends got killed, is they could see their footprints. But he stood right next to the king. In his invisibleness and wasn't killed. It's funny about the part where the, the Nagas take him to their realm. That's later. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's coming. It's later. <laughs> when he's seduced by this. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, basically, I say this because it's like in many stories, like there's, there's a turn from the secular uh, to the monastic, from uh, everyday pleasure and success to some question that turns someone. Uh, so in a way, this is like his way-seeking mind talk. <laughs> oh, this is what happened. This is what got me into practice. And he met someone. It, it, it says he uh, mastered the text, right? He, he mastered the practice and he got it. It's like the Buddha. And he was like, something not quite complete about this. And an old guy introduced him to the, <laughs> the Mahayana approach. And I'll read a little bit about this. Um, if you're following, it's in the middle of page 15. But this is, this is following his um, bad night out on the town. You know, the way the story goes, you chase the women, you get threatened, you almost get killed, it wakes you up, you go to the monastery and become a great sage. It, why does that happen on 6th Street? <laughs> you don't know that it's not. Yeah. That's yeah. true. <laughs> So he says that the brush with death impressed on the young man how craving leads to anguish. He escaped from the palace and fled to the mountains where he became a monk and studied the teachings of the Buddha way. This is what I had excerpted from here. The Mahayana, or great vehicle, was at the time of Nagarjuna a newly emerging movement of thought and practice whose advocates criticized the spiritual detachment and social isolation of those monks who claim to represent the early Buddhist tradition. Are, are most of you familiar with this, this shift? From the, the, in the early Buddhist tradition, tradition, it was the way of the arhat of, of uh, practicing to seek individual enlightenment and escaping the cycle of birth and death. The Mahayana suggested that the essence of the Buddhist teachings, born out of compassion, arising naturally from the understanding of Paticca Samapada is that you would practice for the benefit of everyone. No separation. Such people, they maintained, in the old school, placed too great an emphasis on the attainment of their own liberation and ignored the plight of the world. The Mahayanas took as their ideal the Bodhisattva, one who seeks awakening not merely for his or her own sake, but in order to be able to liberate others from suffering. So you practice so you can assist others. Followers of this movement believe that such ideas were not new, but had been expounded by the historical Buddha. The discourses in which Gautama taught Mahayana doctrines had, however, only been preserved in non-human realms. Now the Mahayanas believe the time was right for their dissemination on earth. It's the, the part of the funny mythological story about the Nagas. They're these sort of strange snake-like creatures that took the Prajnaparamita Sutras and put them down to the bottom of the ocean and hit them because no one could understand it. And they were waiting, like for the right time. <clears throat> so Nagarjuna was sufficiently inspired by the vision of these teachings, which this old monk had taught to him, that he left his mountain retreat and wandered through India in search of other Mahayana discourses. Now he goes on and he sort of gets a big head. He decides that he's mastered all this and he can defeat anyone in debate. So he thinks, I'm the guy. <clears throat> but the Nagas, watching him do this, were like, okay, okay, okay. This must be our guy. We're gonna have to help him out because he's being <laughs> foolish. Let's, let's go ahead and give him the text. So they, um, it says the wisdom discourses of the Prajna Paramita Sutra 
from which the Heart Sutra is taken are a series of inspirational dialogues between the Buddha and his leading disciples and explore at length the metaphysical implications of emptiness. And in the Heart Sutra that we chanted last time, you know, it's really Avalokiteshvara who's speaking to Shariputra, his primary dis disciple. And it's, as I mentioned, the only place in all the sutras where Avalokiteshvara speaks. And so the Bodhisattva of Compassion is the one speaking about wisdom. It's a, it's a very unique setting. Through studying these texts, Nagarjuna was convinced of the centrality of emptiness in the process of awakening. For he realized that the path taught by the Buddha was grounded in a deep, intuitive understanding of the sublime contingency of self and things. On returning to India from the Naga realms, where they took him, he then composed verses from the center and other commentaries on the wisdom discourses, thus accelerating the spread of Mahayana Buddhism. So I read all this because it gives you a little bit of the tale, and it also says why Nagarjuna is so central in Mahayana thought. Because he's the guy that supposedly got the Prajnaparamita text and began to emphasize the spread of the Mahayana tradition. <clears throat> uh, so, on page two, the first paragraph there, whoever else he may have been, um, let's hear another voice from emptiness now. Someone else can read. No one's reading. It's empty voice. <laughs> whoever else he may have been, Marjana was indisputably the first person after the historical Buddha to disclose the Dharma in a voice of his own. So that's, that's very important. Of all the things, one of the things that's crucial is that from the Buddhist time on, he was the first one who had a unique and new voice coming out. So that's, go ahead. The Garjana's verses from the center served as a catalyst to trigger the chain of events that was to revolutionize Buddhist tradition. Through his startling sequences of verses, Nagarjuna recovered the core liberating insights of the Buddha's teaching and articulated them in an original and compelling language. So this now sets it in the context of what we're going to meet. Clear? So far? I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Any questions? I don't understand how the Mahayana Buddhism, that so much time could have passed from when Buddha had his realization of the teacher Samapada. Like, how could it have not been a more bodhisattva-oriented <coughs> philosophy before that? Like, how could it have been a self-centered thing for all that time until the Mahayanas came along? Well, I don't know that it was self-centered. I think there was an emphasis on a certain way. Okay. And, uh, and I'm not a scholar on a lot of those distinctions, so I can't answer the question really super well, mm -hmm. fully. What I can tell you is that, remember, this was... There was no Buddhism. There was Siddhartha Gautama who woke up as a Hindu in a Hindu country with Hindu teachings in a Hindu culture. And so just that turn, that there wasn't an Atman, that there was no individually existing self, that's the big shift. And so oh, there's no individually existing self. I could wake up in this lifetime. That was a revolutionary thought. And it was not dependent on caste. It was outside of the social order. It was the same revolution in Hinduism that Jesus did in Judaism. It's like blew out something. I mean, he was a Jew. It was just like, it was a, there was no Buddhism, there was no Christianity. But something happened that was so big, it resonates today as a new stream. And so it began in the Hindu culture with people using those practices to try to unseat a little, or try to understand what they had been steeped in. So I think maybe that's a little okay. piece that's important. Okay. But there, there's lots of um, scholarly discussion about the origins of Mahayana and when it oh, it's really happened. Okay. But, but most of them seem to feel it's like in the first... 100 to 200 years after the Buddha's death. It wasn't way, way later. Okay. There are streams of it. And some of the research also suggests that there isn't a steady, like an original text and then they built. It's like a web. 
there were pieces of this coming all over the place, and it began to to form up. It's very interesting if you if you like that kind of scholarly stuff, but I can't speak to it very okay. well. <clears throat> so I put in bold here. What did this voice sound like? This new uh, this new voice, and what were its implications? <clears throat> Would someone like to read the next paragraph? Yeah. Emptiness is not a state, but a way. Not only is it inseparable from the world of contingencies, it too is contingently configured. Okay, better stop there. <laughs> so it's not a state, as opposed to other states. States come and go. So it's not a state. It's a, it's a way. And not only is it not inseparable from the world of contingencies, it too is contingently configured. Because what isn't? It's so this kind of pulling the rug out of every single thing is where we're headed. Go ahead. To experience emptiness is not a descent into an abyss of nothingness, nor, a, nor an ascent into a separate realm. Yeah, the two ways we normally think of it, right? It is a recovery of the freedom to configure oneself as an intentional, unimpeded trajectory through the shifting, ambiguous sands of life. Now there's a sentence for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of beautiful, but then you think, now what the hell, what was that? <laughs> to recognize emptiness is not a negation of life. It gives us a glimpse of what enables anything to happen at that's amazing. To recognize emptiness is not a negation. You begin to see what it enables anything to happen at all. So please, if there are questions or comments or as we go along, please offer them. Just enjoy like not getting it. You know, like I'm just feeling my brain. Just like, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, just wait. not going through. If you like middle, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait till we start reading it. I'm just preparing you to warm up. Oh, but here's some of it right here. Read, read that. When emptiness is possible, everything is possible. Were emptiness impossible, nothing would be possible. It's very important not to try to conceive of what's here. <laughs> but to flow with it and let it just keep opening you. <clears throat> Emptiness is a way of talking, not taking. <laughs> talking about the sublime depth, mystery, and contingency that are revealed as one probes beneath the surface of anything that seems to exist in self-sufficient isolation. I would also read that sentence as Emptiness is the, way, is the way of practicing the sublime depth, mystery, and contingency that are revealed as one sits and sits and sits and probes beneath the surface of anything and everything that seems to exist, exist in self-sufficient isolation. That's what we do when we sit, really. Emptiness is the untraceability of any such isolated thing. That's a, a, a beautiful little sentence that says, when you look at, is there someone in there? And you can't find it. Yet for something to be empty does not imply that there's nothing there at all. Were there a trace of something, says Nagarjuna, there would be a trace of emptiness. Were there no trace of anything, there would be no trace of emptiness. See, this, that's the other thing. You're going to give prelude to the fourth session on Dogen. You're going to see, oh, this is what he was actually Referring teaching to. to. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. To understand emptiness does not mean that emptiness becomes a discrete object of a consciousness. Emptiness is experienced. So it doesn't become an object. Emptiness is experienced as the letting go of fixed ideas about oneself and the world. I know this is repetitive, 
but you can see the necessity of such repetition. So that something moves inside apart from your understanding. Buddhas say emptiness is relinquishing opinions. Believers in emptiness are incurable. <laughs> and you, you will see like in the Shin Shin Ming, don't get caught in emptiness. There, there are ways in which this stuff gets talked about. <clears throat> Buddhas say emptiness is relinquishing opinions, but if you turn that into a belief, believers in emptiness are incurable. You're stuck, right back where you started. One can become fixated on emptiness as easily as anything else. It's not one thing, it's another. <clears throat> so let's, let's uh, read a little more. Someone like to start with running through the verses? Running through the verses is an urgency that reveals Nagarjuna's determination to ease the existential and linguistic fixations that keep one locked in repetitive cycles of anguish. He pulls the comfortable rug of common sense from beneath one's feet, short-circuiting the habits of mind, leaving nothing to hold on to. Instead of the consolation of belief, he holds out the tantalizing possibility of freedom. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, why it's so different than ordinary religious discourse. It doesn't give you anything to hold on to or to believe in. He invites you into a space in which you can fall into freedom. Stumbling, <coughs> confused, open and free. <laughs> That's good, John. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to think, like, this feels so freeing, you know, when you're talking yeah. about it. It feels so great, but I feel like there have been, there was a time in my life where I feel like I engaged a similar sort of sort of questions and it led to like deep like cynicism and isolation, you know, like I constantly If you ask the same questions, rugs, you know. If you ask the same questions and do the same kind of thing, but somewhere you still have eternalism or nihilism as your endpoint, you're just gonna be ping ponging back and forth. Yeah. Unless you have the middle way, as you understand contingency is the middle way, you're gonna end up in those dead ends every time. And like for us to be here talking about this and having it bring this up, yeah, it's just like so liberating because it, like my brain can't wrap around why it's not mm -hmm. just terrifying. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> There's moments. What do you mean contingency is in the way? <clears throat> that the um, Dependent co-arising <clears throat> can't be held as either is or is not in those earlier quotations. As everything dependently co-arises, you can't say it is, but you also can't say it's not. And it's the, the middle way. It's the, the, the way between those two polarities, which actually isn't a point between them. It's a vast space that holds it all, which is contingency. And once again, talking about this is a little hard, but is that feel like a response? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess the way I feel it is the idea of flow, right? Just just trying to flow for life. And um, I guess my struggle with flow is having to distinguish between flowing and being just in the status quo, like where does desire come to all of this? Um, you know, it's like you can just flow, but then are you just being complacent? Or but you, you think, think, but you think flow means, means not engaged? I probably am. Yeah. yeah, so you're using mm -hmm. flow as that's not quite it. Mm -hmm. If it automatically creates the other side, well then, as soon as you have that question that is the flip side, it makes you confused, you know you're not in the middle way. You're in duality. So that's actually useful. And when you have that, it's like, oh, that must not be it, because I, I, I know it's counter. There is no counter. Yeah. 
which is even harder. Is that what he means by easing the linguistic fixations that keep us locked in repetitive cycles of anguish? I mean, how... Wait, so what does he mean by that? What do you think he means by that? Easing the linguistic fixations. Um, well, I think that he would ease them by taking them apart. As yeah, doing. and we'll see because we're, right we're reading, we're starting to read little pieces of it, uh -huh. but we'll read whole pieces so you can get a feel for how brilliantly he uses language. What he was doing, okay. Yeah, in a way that your mind can't hold on to, but instead invites you into an openness, a surrender. He says, you know, Nagarjuna is not interested in simply reiterating the Buddha's discourses or offering formulaic reinterpretations of orthodox doctrines. This, this was part of why he was unique. Because he was teaching a unique, he wasn't just teaching the Buddha's teachings, which is what everyone had done until that time. The verses embody the movement of a supple but disquieting intelligence, <laughs> which constantly has to sidestep the logical traps of language Nagarjuna cannot help but use. This is what we're we're thinking about when we're thinking about flow and desire and to, you know we we have to use language, but we see man it traps us every time. His awareness of self and other, something and other, nothing, is expressed in a voice that is exotic and inquisitive, dramatic and tentative, and always poised to surprise, such as believers and Buddhas who vanish into nirvana, don't imagine empty Buddhas vanishing or not. Don't imagine empty Buddhas vanishing or not. There's a line we'll look at in Dogen where it says, when Buddhas are truly Buddhas, they do not necessarily notice that they're Buddhas, yet they are actualized Buddhas who go on actualizing Buddhas. Nagarjuna has relatively little to say about emptiness. Each poem is an attempt to disclose emptiness through the play of language. I did want to make note, which I did here, fixations. He says, fixations do not manufacture a false reality. Here's your fixations. They don't manufacture a false reality. They exaggerate what is merely contingent. I thought that was an interesting way of saying, saying it. For Nagarjuna, the problem lies not in the way the world is, but the way it, it's construed, the way we construe it. In seeing things to be or not to be, fools fail to see a world at ease. I think Shakespeare read that one. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that Shakespeare must have read. Okay. Yes, he must have. <laughs> <laughs> or, since um, Nagarshan did not write in English, oh. Bachelor probably read. Shakespeare. Who, because he's British. He's British. <laughs> <laughs> to elevate anything, to elevate anything, to elevate anything, however noble or exalted, to the status of a transcendent reality beyond this world, is fi fixation's final and yet perhaps most seductive strategy of all. To make things special, sacred, precious. When transfixed on what's unwavering beyond fixation's range, we see no Buddha nature. Buddha nature is the nature of the world. Buddha nature has no nature, nor does this world. 
Okay, that's so weird. Let's all read it together. Okay. When words unwavering, beyond fixation's range, you see no Buddha nature. Buddha nature is the nature of the world. Buddha nature has not nature, nor does this world. Buddha nature is the nature of the world, which has no nature. It's a very interesting way to talk about emptiness. Huh? When transfixed, think about it, embody it, when transfixed on what's unwavering, beyond fixation's range, you see no Buddha nature. I'll say it the backwards way. When you see beyond your fixations, you expect to see Buddha nature. Oh, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to see Buddha nature. When I go beyond my fixations. When transfixed on what's unwavering beyond fixations range, you see no Buddha nature. What? Buddha nature is the nature of the world. It has no nature, nor does the world. You ready to uh, plunge into unfathomable life now? <laughs> Those of you that have a book, uh, we're going to read um, number, page 131, Contingency. Now, I'm going to just read it through and just buckle your seatbelt and hang on for the ride, and then we can go back and take it little by little. We're not going to try to, it's like, it's like poetry. It would be uh, harsh to, you know, pull it all apart and do too much with it, because it is poetry, but we are, but we might comment on the flow with it a little bit. But I'm actually going to start with this one well into the text. Thank you. Because it does talk about our core teaching from the Buddha, contingency. Blocked by confusion. So you got that so far, right? <laughs> Blocked by confusion, I forge a destiny through impulsive acts. Consciously, I enter situations where personality unfolds and world impacts on a sensitive soul. Personality creates Consciousness, just as attention, the eye, and a colorful shape trigger vision. Impact is the meeting of consciousness, senses, and the world. It leads to experience I crave to have and avoid. Craving makes me cling at senses, opinions, rules, and selves. Clinging is to insist on being someone. Not to cling is to be free, to be no one. To be someone is to be a conscious, impulsive, thinking, feeling body, which is born, ages, dies, suffers torment, grief, pain, depression, and anxiety. Anguish emerges when someone is born. Anguish emerges when someone is born. Impulsive acts are the root of life. Fools are impulsive. The wise see things as they are. When confusion stops through insight, impulsive acts cease. Stop this, and that will not happen. Anguish will end. That's not, that was not so hard, is it? This grieves that. Do this. It also refers a bit to what you see in the, um, the uh, Heart Sutra. No eye, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no sound, no such, no taste. You no. Know, each of those sense objects and mind objects is part of what creates. And then freedom, when Avalokiteshvara is saying, oh, 
beyond this consciousness, I can see there's freedom. When those things don't create self. <clears throat> so let's talk about self. We're going to go back to actors. That's what we're referring to them. Stop me anytime you want. I'm just going to be careening along here. Actors. Real actors do not perform real acts, nor unreal actors unreal acts. Real actors are inactive. Real acts need no actors. I warn you. <laughs> real actors do not perform unreal acts, nor unreal actors real acts. Unreal acts and unreal actors need no causes. No causes, no causality. No causality, no activity, actors or performance. No performance, no good and bad. No good and bad, no fruits of good and bad. No fruits of good and bad, no way to heaven, no way to freedom. Unreal, real actors do not perform real, unreal acts. Reality and unreality cancel each other out. Actors depend on acts, and acts depend on actors. I cannot see it otherwise. When acts and actors vanish, you understand clinging and everything else. <laughs> so it's better to start at the end. When acts and actors vanish, when you don't segment things out, you understand clinging and, and everything else. Actors depend on acts. Acts depend on actors. <coughs> I cannot see it otherwise. In the center part, no, no causes, no causality, no causality, no activity, actors or performances, no performances. Are, do you remember the 12-fold chain? One thing leads to another to create self. <clears throat> Some of those unreal actors performing unreal acts, like that stuff, I don't know about. <laughs> it would take a while to let yourself sit with that stuff. Think of Congress. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> think of Congress. Yeah, think of Congress, right. <laughs> I'd prefer not. Unreal actors, unreal acts. Sounds like lots of you don't even care a lot about it. Yeah. Let's um, read a little bit about birth here. Were birth conditioned, it would be born and live and die like all conditioned things. So think if birth, just birth, if birth were conditioned, it, birth, would be born and live and die like all conditioned things. Were it unconditioned, how could it describe conditioned things? Does birth give birth to itself and something else, like light illuminates itself and something else. Light illuminates by shedding darkness. Can light dispel a dark it never meets? Were darkness shed by light it never meets, a single lamp could lift the darkness of a galaxy. Galaxy. If light illuminates itself in nothing else, does the dark obscure itself in other things? How can a child that's not yet born give birth to itself? What has been born, what's not yet born, what is being born, do not give birth. Everything contingent is naturally at ease. When everything is dying, can I be born and live? Could I live, but neither age nor die? The living are not the dying, nor the unliving the dying. Neither milk nor butter causes milk to cease. Finally, a line you can get. <laughs> neither milk nor butter causes milk to cease. Something real would never die. Something 
can't be nothing. Nothing, too, would never die. You can't behead a person twice. You can't behead a person twice. <laughs> when we get to Dogen, there's going to be a whole thing about birth and death that you'll see was drawn from some of this. So without continuing on, how's it going out there? <laughs> it's really even harder when you can't see it. You're not reading along. If you don't have the book, it's a little harder. That's why I gave you some examples so you can see kind of how it goes. You, your mind just starts shutting down after a while. You can't. But you, but you get a sense of the play of the language. I like that he puts a lot of it in questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like he's totally like certain about everything in the way that he wants to show that he's certain. The questions make it feel more friendly. Yeah, because he's speaking about beyond certainty. Completeness, but no certainty. Contingency, but certainty. So if there's certainty, then you can nail it down. I love how playful and poetic this translation is, because other Nagarjuna like, <coughs> translations that I've read, this last one reminded me kind of more what I was used to reading, which are like, it's very syllogistic. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, you think there's a table? Well, if there was a table, there would have to be this, and there's not this, so there's not a table. Boom. You know what I mean? The next, and it's just like these... If P, then this is a masterful. P, you know, yeah. just grinding out the fact that all things are empty. It's very unsatisfying. Yes. <laughs> but I really like it as poetry. I couldn't do the logic, but hearing it, everything feels just right. But there's no way I could really would take a while to explain what I mean by that. But you know, it just feels like oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to read a part of a longer one uh, on awakening. We'll get to awakening. <laughs> the Dharma taught by Buddhas hinges on two truths. Partial truths of the world and truths which are sublime. Without knowing how they differ, you cannot know the deep. Without relying on convictions, you cannot disclose the sublime. Without intuiting the sublime, you cannot experience freedom. Without relying on conventions, I said convictions. Without relying on conventions, not disclose this in line. Okay, misperceiving emptiness injures the unintelligent like mishandling a snake or miscasting a spell. <laughs> misperceiving emptiness injures the unintelligent. Hey, you can hurt yourself with this stuff. <laughs> you don't understand. It. Like mishandling a snake or miscasting a spell. The Buddha despaired of teaching the Dharma, knowing it hard to intuit its depths. Your muddled conclusions do not affect emptiness. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Your muddled conclusions do not affect emptiness. Your denial of emptiness does not affect me. Now back to a piece we took out earlier. When emptiness is possible, everything is possible. Were emptiness impossible, nothing would be possible. In projecting your faults onto me, you forget the horse you're riding. <laughs> <laughs> to see things existing by nature is to see them without causes or conditions. To see things by nature, it's all to see them without causes and conditions. Thus, subverting causality. Agents, tools, and acts. Starting, stopping, in my opinion. Contingency is emptiness, which, contingently configured, is the middle way. Everything is contingent. Everything is empty. Were everything not empty, 
there would be no rising and passing. Ennobling truths would not exist. Without contingency, how could I suffer pain? This shifting anguish has no nature of its own. If it did, how could it have a cause? Deny emptiness and you deny the origins of suffering. It goes on. So one of the things I think would be useful if you're curious about this stuff is to, to find some of them that speak to you particularly and hang out with them a little bit. Um, I would suggest a couple of things. Number one, find one you kind of like or gets you or just you know something and write it out by hand. Don't type it in the computer. Write it, take the time to use your body to write it out. And then read it time, time, read it, read it, read it. Just keep, like, soak it in. And do basically your own version, some of you know of this, of uh, the Lectio Divina. It's the deepening into a sacred text. So, out in the margins, write in or underline words or phrases that stand out as pieces. They, like, capture you. Like, what? That? Ooh. Ooh. Just let yourself feel what captures you, a word or a phrase. Read it again. Then when you hear those words and phrases, what do you feel? What moves in your body? Not what it means. What moves in response? Read it again. Then what is, what's being informed and what's informing about what you're reading? Not the, not the meaning of the text. What comes to you? So just copy, read, 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 words and phrases, feelings. What's informed or informing? So you can take text and, and relate to it, get to know it, fall in love with it, make love to it, uh, let it beat you up. Everything, you know, and see what relationship you end up with it. Because if I just keep reading them, you just keep kind of swimming, you know. <laughs> but it's kind of fun. I do want to say one more thing about Buddha nature. Here's this one on Buddha nature, since we touched on it a while ago. Buddha nature. It's not physical, emotional, conceptual, impulsive, conscious, or anything else. <laughs> It does not dwell in us, nor we in it. It does not own us. If it depended on us, or on anything else, it would not be in itself. How could it be anything but itself? Could what is not itself be Buddha nature? What is it apart from itself, or something else? Is it independent of body, feeling, thought, impulse, or consciousness? It depends on them now and is set to continue. Can you say that Buddha nature is contingent when what is dependent on, when what is dependent on and what depends are both empty? It goes on and on. We think, once again, we take Buddha nature and think it's a thing. So let's like come back down to earth here for a moment. Let's look at the other form. <laughs> we'll let this Zimborska finish this up here. <laughs> this is one of my favorite poems in some ways because it's an entire garment of an empty. Yeah, me too. I'm with you on that. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand all of that. I um, begin to have a, f um, a sense of what it's pointing to. That's what's important. 
And it, I feel, it, if I try to understand it, I get heavier. If I let it move through me, I start lightening up. Like, what are you talking about? And that move, those moves, are the point in practice. <clears throat> we call it a grain of sand. That it calls itself neither grain nor sand. It does just fine without a name, whether general, particular, permanent, passing, incorrect, or out. Our glance, our touch, mean nothing to it. It doesn't feel itself seen and touched. And that it fell on the windowsill is only our experience, not its. For it, it is no different from falling on anything else, with no assurance that it is finished falling, or that it is falling still. The window has a wonderful view of the lake, but the view doesn't view itself. It exists in this world colorless, shapeless, soundless, odorless, and painless. The lake's floor exists floorlessly, and its shore exists shorelessly. Its water feels neither wet nor dry, and its waves to themselves are neither singular nor plural. They splash deaf to their own noise on pebbles neither large nor small. And all this, beneath the sky, by nature skyless, in which the sun sets without setting at all, and hides without hiding behind unminding clouds. The wind ruffles it, its only reason being that it blows. A second passes. A second, second. A third. But they're only seconds. They're seconds, three, three seconds only for us. Time has passed like a courier with urgent news. But that's just a simile. The character is invented. His haste is make believe. His news is human. Pretty much all on the margin of it. Isn't that beautiful? It's really spectacular, I think. That she could call forward in this most mundane thing, almost everything that we talked about, that which <clears throat> in Utopia suggests this is the place we leave. First, she described what we aspire to, thinking it will get us something, but actually it's nowhere. And then a view, a view with a grain of sand. That's the vision of the sublime. Where no thing is a thing, no description captures or splits reality. And in the process of everything being pulled out from under the rest, we are completely completely held. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let's do our verses of the robe again. Do it three times. The short, the short S version of the narration of tonight. That's the robe of liberation. A formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation. A formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Well, well, I hope that we approached something that's kind of rough to approach in a way that has some life to it. I, I know there are moments in there where you look a little dead, but. Uh, 
reading through this stuff is a little hard. But I want to um, give thanks to Stephen Batchelor for his beautiful translation for Vislavas and Borska for embodying these teachings in a way that is really magnificent and stunning. And uh, for all of you for showing up so that we can uh, hear these voices uh, and touch these teachings, um, which came out of the original Buddhist teaching. Uh, and next time, we'll take it over the Himalayas into China and see how it met Taoism uh, and spoken in a new kind of elegance. <laughs>